been a while since we did any contour integration here on the channel. So I thought, why not today? So we're evaluating the integral from 0 to infinity of x to the 1 third divided by 1 plus x squared with respect to x. And we're going to call this integral i. Now, with any uh, contour integration, we're going to be making use of the residue theorem, which states that if you, if you have the uh, integral over some closed contour of a complex value function f of z, then this equals 2 pi i times the sum of the residues of the function f of z enclosed by your contour. And I'm going to introduce the keyhole contour and show you how to use it. Now the corresponding function in the complex world is f of z equals z to the one third divided by one plus z squared. And we see this function has poles at places where one plus z squared equals zero, which implies that z equals positive or negative i. Now for our contour, let me just draw the uh, complex plane where the x-axis represents the real part of complex numbers and the y-axis represents the imaginary part. Now this is what the keyhole contour looks like. There's a branch cut around the origin of, uh, in the shape of a small circle of radius, say epsilon. And since I've marked it on the, uh, on the negative half of the x-axis, I'll mark this as negative epsilon. And there are a couple of parallel lines, a couple of straight lines parallel to the x-axis that link up to a bigger circle of radius r. So let's mark this as negative r. And the height or the vertical distance between the, uh, the two parallel lines and the, uh, and the real axis is some positive number, say, delta. So uh, it's delta up here, and the height below the x-axis in this case is negative delta. And our contour, C call it, will enclose both the poles of the function. Now the first pole was at positive i, so that's one on the imaginary axis, and negative i means negative one on the, um, uh, on the imaginary axis. And you're traversing this in the anti-clockwise sense, correct? And obviously you're interested in the limiting cases. And the limiting cases that we're interested in are r going to positive infinity, epsilon going to zero, and delta going to zero. Because in the limit as delta approaches zero, you're essentially approaching the real line itself, right? So this is how you're going to traverse the contour, and this is how, uh, and these are the limits, uh, these are the limits along which uh, using these are the limits you're going to use to evaluate the various parts of this contour. And by parts, I mean this big circle, call it gamma, this little circle, call it little gamma, and these two lines, call them L1 and L2. Now with this contour, one thing to take special care of is the fact that if you're walking along the line L sub 1, in that case, any complex number on this line, let's call the argument of the complex number phi, well, all complex numbers along this line have, a, have an argument of zero. However, for the line L sub 2 traversed in the reverse direction, any complex number on it has an argument of 2 pi. So now that we have our contour sorted out, we can proceed to calculating the integral over the closed contour C using the residue theorem. So this equals 2 pi i times the sum of the residues enclosed by our contour. And we see that our contour encloses both residues. Now you have two residues enclosed here. So you have 2 pi i times the sum of two limits. One is the limit as z approaches i, and the other is the limit as z approaches negative i. Now, for the first limit, you have z minus i times our function, which is z to the one third divided by one plus z squared. And this will be added to the limit as z approaches negative i of z plus i times z to the one third divided by z squared plus one. So evaluating these limits is pretty easy, knowing that the factorization of one plus z squared is z minus i times one plus z. So you have some nice cancellations going around, going along here. Uh, this is going to be z minus i factor left behind. So 
plugging in these limits, you have uh, i to the one third divided by two i plus negative i to the one third divided by negative two i. Now you can factor out the twos here and that will just cancel out with the two outside. So let's get rid of them. And we have pi times i. And I'm gonna write all of this in complex, in uh, write all of these complex numbers in polar form because that actually kind of cleans up the uh, the complex algebra, it makes it rather nice. So you have e to the, uh, i is I e to the i pi by 2, so i pi by 6 divided by e to the i pi by 2, plus, now this is a negative i. Negative i means that this is where your, uh, this is the endpoint of the vector representing the complex number. So we see that the argument in this case has a value of three pi by two. So we can write it as e to the three pi by two times i times one third, some cancellation here, boring. And this is again i, right? So i divided by negative i, which is just negative one, okay. Okay, and uh, some simplification here and just fuck it and write the result. Okay, now that we know what the integral over the closed contour C evaluates to, we can proceed with the actual fun stuff of breaking it down into its parts. So we have an integral over the big circle gamma plus an integral over the little, over the, uh, little circle uh, little gamma plus a couple of integrals over the lines L sub 1 and L sub 2. And we know that all of this will evaluate to pi times i times e to the negative i pi by 3 minus 1, which can be separated later into real and imaginary parts. And now let's study the behavior of this gamma integral here. In the limiting cases of r going to infinity and epsilon and delta both going to 0. So under such circumstances, this integral is, in terms of a parameterization, uh, now any complex number z on this big circle gamma can be parameterized as r times e times, uh, r times e to the i phi. So this integral under the limits of uh, epsilon and delta going to zero is now an integral, looks like an integral from zero to two pi, of z to the one third, so that's going to be r to the one third times e to the i phi by three divided by one plus r squared, um, uh, e to the two i phi times a differential element. So now that we have the structure in place, we can make use of the result that if we're integrating some function, uh, if we're integrating some function f over a contour gamma, and we take the modulus, it's going to be less than or equal to the integral over the same contour gamma of the absolute value of that same function f. So making use of this result and transforming the equality into an inequality and just distributing the modulus operator over uh, all the, all of the, uh, over the product terms involved, so we now have um, r is just a positive number, so r to the one third, and e to the i phi by three, because phi by three is a real number, its modulus reduces to one, and so that's done with the modulus of i is one, same case over here, and again the positive number r. And this is being divided by one plus r squared times e to the two i phi, the modulus of it anyway integration with respect to phi. Now again I can make use of another result that uh, the reciprocal of the modulus of one, by, uh, 1 plus r squared times e to the 2i phi, this is less than or equal to 1 by r squared minus 1. So again you can write this as the integral from 0 to 2 pi of r to the 4 by 3 divided by r squared minus 1 integration with respect to phi. And clearly in the limit as r goes to infinity, the integral collapses to 0. So that means this integral here over gamma evaluates to 0. And now what about the case for the integral over the contour little gamma? Well, uh, 
In this case, let's just worry about the modulus of the function f of z, which under the parameterization uh, equals the modulus of z, which is e uh, epsilon times e to the i phi to the one-third modulus, and this clearly evaluates to epsilon to the one-third divided by the modulus of one plus epsilon squared e to the two i phi, where again we make use of this result and write this as an inequality with an epsilon squared minus one involved. Now clearly as epsilon approaches zero, um, the modulus of f of z approaches zero as well. So this integral too collapses to zero. So with our lives so much easier now, we can now turn our attention to the integrals along the straight lines L sub 1 and L sub 2, giving special care, of course, to the nature of the arguments involved. So the integral over L sub 1 equals the integral... Now, we're concerned with the limit, with the limits of as uh, delta goes to zero, epsilon goes to zero, and r goes to infinity, right? So that means we can say, looking at the structure of this integral as the uh, of this contour, as the bigger circle gets bigger and bigger outwards, and the uh, inner circle collapses inwards, and these two uh, parallel lines get closer and closer to the real axis. We're essentially just integrating from zero to infinity on the real axis, right? Now, in the limit as delta approaches zero, these two straight lines, they are sort of squeezed or pushed towards the x-axis. So you're pretty much integrating on the x-axis, on the real axis for this limiting case. And in the limit as r goes to infinity and epsilon goes to zero, you're integrating from zero to infinity, and you can replace the z by the x now because you're uh, on the real axis in the limiting case, of course. So this is x to the one third, and divided by one plus x squared dx, which of course is your integral i. And for the case of L sub two, once again, remember that any complex number on the straight line with these limiting cases has an argument phi of 2 pi. This is because in these limiting cases, it's like you're almost completing one, uh, one uh, round of the circular path. So you're completing one circular path. So any vectors representing uh, complex numbers on the straight line will have their arguments approaching 2 pi within these, uh, due to these limiting cases. Now, any complex number here can be written as uh, z equals the magnitude of z times the argument, right? Which is 2 pi um, i. And raising z to the one-third power will give you uh, the magnitude of z to the one-third times e to the 2 pi i by 3. So because we're pretty much on the x-axis, we can replace this by x to the one-third, so we have, oh, sorry about that, so we have x to the one-third times e to the two pi i by three divided by x squared plus one dx. And notice that you're uh, moving along the x-axis in the leftward direction for this line L sub two. So the limits run from infinity to zero or you can just flip the limits and place a negative sign here. So you're integrating from zero to infinity. And this reduces out to e to the two pi i by three being a constant. There's a negative sign and there's your, uh, there's the integral i. So it's all come together quite nicely here. On the left hand side, you have i times pi times e to the um, negative. No, wait, wait, wait. I think there was, let me check. Let me check, there was, yeah, e to the negative i pi by three minus one equal to these two integrals collapsing to zero, and then you had i minus e to the two pi i by three times i, 
which implies that factoring out the i on the right hand side, that, which implies that i is equal to i times pi times e to the negative i pi by 3 minus 1 divided by e to the uh, 2 pi i by 3 um, negative sign and a plus 1 over here. Now, if you separate the term in the numerator into real and imaginary parts, you get um, pi by 3. So the cosine of pi by 3 is uh, 1 by 2, right? So we have 1 by 2 minus i to the square root of 3 by 2 minus 1 divided by this term here, 1 minus e to the 2 pi i by 3. And 1 half minus 1 is negative 1 half. So you can factor out a negative sign outside as well. And once you factor that out, you have something interesting. This is now the this is now the complex number e to the i pi by 3. And it's being divided by 1 minus e to the 2 pi i by 3. And if you multiply upstairs and downstairs by e to the um, negative pi by th uh, negative i pi by 3, then in the numerator, you're going to get negative i pi divided by uh, negative sign e to the, when you multiply this term with this term, you get i pi by 3, negative sign, and a plus 1. So that turns into an e to the negative i pi by 3. And further, you can factor another negative sign out and divide upstairs and downstairs by 2i. So that has the benefit of canceling out the negatives, canceling out the i's, and in the denominator, what you have is the definition of the sine function in complex analysis. And this is the sine of pi by 3. So yeah, that is pretty cool. And you, you can uh, write this in the evaluated form, but I'm just going to write it as sine pi by 3 because it looks cooler. Anyway, so I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.